So tonight, this is going to be part of three, but we're going to be talking about what to know about options. And options is a very special advanced creative, creative deal structuring tool. And a lot of people that, that, that don't know how to use it. And I asked the question just a minute ago, why don't more people use options? And I'm going to go into more detail about this either next Wednesday or the following Wednesday. So I've been asking that question to a lot of people. And this isn't a recent thing people are not using. This goes back to, since I started using options. It's never been something that's been a hot button on um, uh, for for investors, and they they the most they know about it is lease options, <laughs> you know, and that's really about it. But all the other things options can do, most investors don't use it. So let's take a look tonight, and let's kind of get you started. So we're going to explain what options can do. So first of all, welcome to this advanced deal structuring school, and I want y'all to know. In fact, I just talked to Vina a few minutes ago, and when we were teaching Ultimate together, she's the one that came up with the idea of doing something like this, doing a weekly um, Zoom school and to get information out. And I think this was absolutely a genius idea. And I just told her this too. I mean, she is best at marketing. And this has been a big help to us when we're trying to get messages out or teach new stuff. And I just want to thank Vina for coming up with this idea. And it helps us all a lot. So if you get a chance and you see Vina, Make sure you thank her for this because this is her idea, right? You know, Zoom was a brand new thing two, three years ago. So for the next three Wednesdays, we'll discuss the power of options. And we're going to be doing three meetings. So one's tonight, uh, one's going to be January 17th, and one will be January the 24th. It'll start at 7 uh, p.m. and at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And all the meetings will be recorded. And... Everyone who registers uh, for the class, even if you can't be here, and a lot of people, I've gotten a lot of phone calls from folks that just cannot be on the call, and they were asking if it's being recorded, and I said yes, and they asked how do they get a copy of the recording, and best way is if you know of someone uh, that is interested in this, have them register for the class because we'll email a link to the recording of all three classes, and you also will find the recordings on our website at Bill and Kim Cook or on our YouTube channel, which is Bill and Kim Cook, or on our Facebook page, which is Bill and Kim Cook. So the topics for the three schools tonight is going to be things to know about options. So this is going to be a little bit general, and you're going to see um, two deals, um, two different options that Kim and I did. Then on the 17th, we'll talk about things options can do, and this will floor you. Because people are just not aware of all the different ways and things an option can do. Again, especially if all you know about options are lease options, and you think that's the, the that's the whole thing. Trust me, that's just the very, very tippy, tippy tip of the iceberg. And there's so much you don't see that's below the water. And so many things that an option can do. And it just amazes me that more people don't use this great tool. Then on the 24th, we're going to talk about the different types of options because there's about five, about six or seven different types of options you can use, and it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, so you know which option to turn to. And get this, one of the options we'll talk about on the 24th is not even an option until it is an option. But the entire time it's not an option until something happens and it turns it into an option. So it's like a butterfly. And that's why she would call it. It's a butterfly option. It's a caterpillar. Until all of a sudden, it is a butterfly. And it's just like that. It's a really interesting type of option. So why are we doing this? Why are Kim and I uh, putting putting together these three, these three classes? And the reason why is it's a lead up. We're going to be teaching uh, our Power of Options seminar again this year uh, in person or uh, on Zoom. It'll be on April 3rd and 4th. It'll be in Tampa, Florida. And it, yes, it will be recorded. And everybody attending whether it's on Zoom or in person, we'll get a recording of the seminar. You're also going to receive a 300-page options manual. But I, I really like that manual a lot. And I've added about another 50, 60 pages to it um, for this, um, this February. And it has several new deals in it. Deals that, in fact, one we're working on right now, I'm getting ready to close on an option. So I'm exercising an option to buy a property. And we should have it closed. I thought it'd be by Friday, but I think it's going to probably be by Monday or Tuesday. But it's just about done. And you also receive all the different documents. It'd be in Word format and fillable format. 
but um, you'll receive the documents I use to do my option work. And this year also, because now I'm doing options in Florida, you also will receive the mortgage. So I, you get the deed of trust that I use in Georgia, but you also now will get the mortgage that I'm using in Florida uh, to do my option work. And the price for our class is normally six ninety seven, and right now we have it on an early bird special. So the price is a hundred dollars off. Can save a hundred dollars, and so it's dropped down to five ninety seven. But the early bird special ends by January twenty eighth, um, two thousand twenty four. And so you know this class will set out sell out. It always does, and our room block ends somewhere around like January sixteenth. And you want to be in the Marriott, and you want to use the room block, but the price goes from like. 180, I think the room is, but it jumps up to like 260 or 270 uh, after the room block. So if you are going to come or thinking about coming, make sure you take advantage of the room block. So first question you're going to have, a lot of you don't know who I am. And you're going to ask what qualifies me to teach about options. And the answer is I attended my first Jack Miller seminar uh, about options back in 1999. And Jack wrote the book, literally wrote the book, the very first course on options back in probably 77 or 1976. And it was like a, a four page book. But he is the one that developed how to use options with single family properties, single pro family investment properties. And so I attended my first class that he taught options in 99. I went to every options class he took between 1999 and the time he passed in 2009. And the first time I heard it, the first time I heard someone talk about options, when I heard Jack talk about options, I was hooked. I, I knew that that was for me. I, I just, I was amazed by it. it. It took me a little bit before I did my first option. It was 2001 before I did, we did our first two uh, option, option deals. And since 2010, after Jack passed, I have been getting my uh, information and learning at the feet of uh, the feet of Pete Fortunato who is, you know, unarguably the greatest creative deal structuring mind in real estate for us today. So a phenomenal man. So I'm always grateful for Pete for the things and he's taught me and the time he's take, he takes with me. So um, for the past two decades, options have been the, the creative deal structuring tool that Kim and I have used most often. And I say that to say this, I can't think of the last time I did a deal where some sort of option work wasn't involved in the deal. I mean, I'm going to have to go back a number of years because options are always involved in my deals, as you'll see throughout the three-day course, uh, three uh, the three-day uh, deal school. So of all the creative deal structuring tools, options have generated the greatest increase of wealth for me and Kim. And you're thinking to yourself, how do options generate wealth. And I want you to see a deal that Kim and I did back in 2010. <laughs> so this is not the picture of the actual property. Hey, Kim, can you let Andrew in, please? So this is not the picture of the Apple property, the actual property. This is a deal that we currently have going, as you're going to see. And I didn't want to give out the address and I don't want to give out the picture of the house because um, I just don't want anybody to, you know, ruffle this deal. It is, it's a very good deal. It's going strong. I really have enjoyed it. Kim and I have done well by it. But uh, anyway, so let's go into the deal. So this property in Waterford is the subdivision to live in in Cartersville, Georgia. It's by far the best high-end um, subdivision. It's on the river, uh, big mansions, lots, lots of wealth in that, in that if you're, it's who's who of Cartersville, you know, that's where they live is in the Waterford, the Waterford subdivision. And in 2006, this property sold for $600,000. And that 2006 was about the peak of that hot market. In 2010, we bought this house at the foreclosure auction for $140,000. And if you're new to investing since 2012, you're thinking, how on earth do you, was it trashed out? And the answer is no, the house was in great shape. But back in 2010, we were in the heart of the Great Recession, and you could buy houses for pennies on the dollar. And when we went to this foreclosure auction, um, there were there was probably about 180, 190 properties cried on the steps that day, and there was only two of us on the steps bidding on, on houses. So there was no investors on the steps. 
and lots and lots of houses being foreclosed on. So it was a really great time to be an investor, especially if you understood creative deal structuring. So the property, we did do a $30,000 rehab to it. So our all-in cost on this deal was $170,000. And then we listed it with Bonnie, who's been our long-term realtor. And that listing price was $260,000. Now, another thing you should know about me is I am very big on open houses. And my realtor is not. And I don't mind that she doesn't want to do open houses. I love doing them. And I'll tell you the most important reason why is when we're doing an open house, a lot of people show up and they tell they tell me before they can buy our house, they had to sell their house. Now, I'm a door knocker. And so the way I find sellers has been going out and knocking on doors. But when we're doing an open house, you're just sitting in there in the air conditioning and, and people who have houses to sell are coming in your house. Are you kidding me? What a great way to find people and get their address. And then when an open house is over with, I go around and visit the different people who need to sell their houses and make written offers. So I love doing open houses. So in this case, um, when we did the open house, the very first open house, we had a ton of people were, that were looking at the house. They were, they were interested. Uh, there were probably at any one time 20 or 30 people in the house continually for the four hours we did the open house. And during the open house, we received two full-priced offers, $260,000 offers for this house. So that was pretty neat. And while, as I tell the story, understand, both buyers were in the house. They wouldn't leave. They, they knew about each other. They understood they each had put in an offer. And I was sitting on the kitchen island. I'm answering questions. And like the two sellers are on either side, you know, they're they're like watching each other and they keep circling me. It was hilarious to watch, but we did receive two full priced offers. But uh, one of the things I noticed, there was a young couple we came through, come, came through and they're, not, they're in their early thirties. They're not had their kids with them. I learned later on, they had two kids, but they were in their early thirties and they really didn't belong looking at this house because this house was meant for someone more 40, 45, 50 years old that had the income to, to be able to own a house like this. <clears throat> and when I started talking to them, I said, well, what are you looking for? And they said, well, you know, we're, we're looking to move closer to the Waterford. And I said, why? And they said, well, he, the, the girl said, my, my, my dad lives here. I was raised here. My dad lives here. My mom lives here. And right now we live in a place called U Harley, which was about 20 minutes away. And they were, the, it was 20 minutes to U Harley, 20 minutes back. So 40 minutes round trip, basically an hour. So whenever the, you had to pick up the kids or drop the kids off, there was an hour trip being done and they were trying to escape that after a couple of years of doing that. And so she said, we're just looking for a place closer. And I said, okay. And I said, well, before you went out, out house hunting, I said, did you get try to get qualified for the mortgage? And she said, yeah, I qualified for a $175,000 mortgage. So nowhere close to the 260 and they didn't have a big down payment. So there was no way they were going to buy the house. So the house that they were in, our house, way, way, way too expensive for them. So one of the things I said is I asked, you know, where are your parents? You said they live here. And she said, well, they're, they're two doors away. My mom and dad live two doors away. And she kind of pointed to where the house was. And I said, well, are they home? And she said, yeah, yeah, they're watching the kids right now. And I said, well, can I go over and talk to them? And she had no idea what I had in mind. All she knows is she can't afford the house. Not even close. And I said, can we go talk to them? And um, the girl said, yeah, let's, let's go over and talk to them. Now, another thing you need to know is Kim had two full-priced offers in her hand. And that meant we were going to make a big chunk of cash. This was, this was supposed to be a flip house, right? And we were going to produce a good bit of money from this. Close to $100,000 or after real estate commissions, all that, probably about $70,000, $80,000. But we could use the money back then. And um, Kim was very excited because at the time I had her using Walmart toilet paper. That's all I let her buy because times were pretty tight and we had all our money in real estate. And um, she was tired of Walmart toilet paper. She wanted some of that good, charm and fluffy stuff. So when I looked at her and said, hey, honey, I'm going to go next door. Kim knows that when I do this at an open house, she, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go make an offer somewhere. I, there's something going on. And she had two full price offers in her hand. And she's like, don't just, Bill, I need you here. Please don't leave. I said, no, no, I'll be right back. And I just kind of walked out the door. So needless to say, I knew I was going to catch the wrath 
when she saw me again, but I, I scooted uh, two doors away to the mom and dad's house. And when we got there, uh, met the mom and dad and we sat down at the kitchen table. So it was me and the mom and dad and the daughter and the son-in-law. <coughs> and I asked a number of questions so I could better understand the daughters and the son-in-law's situation, you know, about having to go back and forth. You know, kids weren't really in the school they wanted them to be in, not the school where she grew up in. There was a number of issues. So I said to her, I said, you know, what if, what if, because you qualified for a $175,000 mortgage, what if you could buy our house for $170,000? Ooh. The dad leaned forward, he goes, wait a minute, what's the catch? And I said, I'm willing to sell them our house for $170,000, provided they give me the right to buy the house back anytime in the next 30 years for $170,000. And the dad kind of leaned back and he said, and I, at the time I wrote a weekly newspaper column that was in the Bartow County paper. And the dad said, you know, sweetheart, I, I, I read this man's column every Sunday. And he always talks about the different deals that he's doing and the structures he's doing. He said, and I've read about a couple of these he's done like this. And he said, I think you should say no. You shouldn't do it. It's not a good investment move for you because you'll get none of the property's appreciation. In other words, I'll sell it to them for 170, but I get to buy it back anytime in 30 years for 170. So he's right. And I said to her, I said, you know, your dad is a very smart man. Obviously, he knows he knows finance. And I said, so your dad's right, but think about it. You can buy a house today that you can't possibly afford for a price that you can easily afford. What's that worth to you? And they were thinking. And I looked at the dad because the dad was the problem. And I didn't care which way they went. I mean, we already had two full priced offers in, but I thought this would be an interesting story. And Matthew will tell you, I love doing deals where there's a there's a better story. And I looked at him and I said, you know, and I took out my financial calculator and laid it in front of him. And I said, obviously, you're a money man. I said, I'm just, you know, out of curiosity, when you're figuring out return on investment and the value of the property two doors away, I said, what value do you place on having your grandkids live two doors away that when they get off the school bus and they come into your house and all that time, extra time that you're going to be spending with them and all the influence you're going to have over them. And you're going to help you know mold your grandkids much better than they lived in a different subdivision. What's that worth? Got to tell you, it got very quiet. And the man, the seconds were just ticking by. And he took a breath and he looked at his daughter and he said, take the deal. So we sold Waterford. The house is worth $260,000. We sold it for $170,000 for what we had in it. Even they, though they qualified for a $175,000 mortgage, I only sold it for one seventy. dollars And your question is, why? why? Why not more than that? And the answer is, one seventy didn't strap them, but more than that, I was looking at the tax side of things too. So if I bought the property, my all-in cost was one hundred and seventy, and I sold it, and all my costs were one hundred and seventy. Do you see that I didn't make any money, so therefore there's no tax cuts? So that's why I sold it for the one seventy. And at closing, when we were at Lee Perkins' office, we received a secured option to buy the property back any time in the next thirty years for $170,000. But let me preface the any time in the next 30 years. One of the things that they said is they don't want to have me come along two or three years from now and just you know buy the property out, you know, have them move when they didn't want to. And they were looking at the kids and getting them out of high school, getting them into college. And so we agreed that I would not exercise my 30-year option for the first 15 years. So they could be there for 15 years. And that property would keep going up in value. And I would not exercise my option. So let's look at today. Today, let's move forward. And I want you to understand why we did this deal. 
today's fair market value on this house is about $700,000. So our option equity, the, the value of our option right now that we did way back then is $530,000. So in other words, we're selling the house for seven, or the house is worth 700. My strike price, the price I need to pay to buy this house back is $170,000. That means right now, the yield on this deal is about 10.152%. And I'm very happy with that. But let's kind of look at this and say, what's the actual yearly yield? And again, I haven't paid the $170,000 to buy it back. So right now my yield is infinite. And it may be, you know, some of the things I can do with it. Um, there's lots of things I can do with this option. But do you see how we use this option to capture this yeah, property's just, appreciation? So as the property has been going up in value... Yeah, Kim, can you mute them, please? As this property, Savannah and I were talking about that. I said, "Listen, I said, Matt that, Owens, I, said Kim. I don't see it as, as competition because there's no, there's no." Hey, Matt, can you mute? I okay. said, "Matt, two Matt wants to use it, great." I said, "But then they like Kelly's paying the tab here. Like Kelly, Kelly needs to make her money." Kim, can you mute? Okay, here we go. Thank you. So we're capturing this property's appreciation. But one of the questions I want, one of the things I want you to see is we talked about different ways options can be run. So we're capturing the appreciation, but not the property's amortization. So my question is, how could we use an option to not just capture the property's appreciation, but also capture the property's amortization? So in other words, as the loan pays down, we're capturing that. Because right now, we set a strike price at 170. So I buy it at 170. How about if I could have my price lowered each month, the people in the house made a payment? And I could do that by changing the wording. In other words, our strike price, our purchase price would have been, and this is the wording that I use on the option, for the then balance of the mortgage. In other words, whenever I exercise my option, if I exercise my option, whatever the balance is on their mortgage then, that will be my purchase price. So this is what I list down instead of saying for $170,000. Do you see how flexible options are? So do options have value? And I get that a lot. If I have an option, you know, what am I supposed to do with it? So what can I do with this option? I want you to think about this. So first question I have for you is, can I continue to hold this option and let it appreciate? Answer is, sure. How about this? Can I sell this option? Do you think maybe there's another investor that would pay me if I would assign this option to him. I mean, think about it. It's five hundred some odd thousand dollars in equity in this option. Do you think maybe someone will pay me two, three, four hundred thousand dollars for it? Of course they will. And if I need money, let's see, I have a deal coming up and I need money. I need fast cash. Don't you think that I can borrow the money and use this option as collateral for the loan? I mean, this is good collateral. The answer is sure, I can do that. But here's what happens with a lot of our options. Might one day, the person who gave me the option come to me and say, what will it take to cancel your option? What will it take to cancel your right to buy our house? Now, that's a conversation we have at that point in time. I never had that conversation at the beginning. I tell them, my goal is to buy your house. That's what I'm going to do. But down the road, sometimes I've had people come to me and say, hey, what will it take you to cancel the option? Now, that's just negotiated out. This is the amount of money that we're going to think. And, you know, I love what Pete says, you know, how badly do you want me to cancel the option? So there's a lot you can do with an option. So don't think that once you have an option, it, you're, you're just stuck in it. And this is a great example of that. Um, this is just one of the many option deals that Kim and I have done over two decades. So would it be beneficial to you to use this deal structuring tool in a future deal? Do you, do you see where maybe an option will come in handy on some deal that you do down the road? And if your answer to that is, yeah, I think I could, uh, that's going to, I'll use that one day. So when do you want to start learning about options? When are you going to start? In 99, I began immediately. When I, I attended a seminar about options. I didn't know what it was about. Didn't know what options were. But as soon as I started learning something about them, I knew that I wanted to start, you know, specializing 
in, in this deal structuring tool. I know it's advanced, but boy, has it been beneficial to us. So now let's answer some basic questions about options. And the first question is, what is an option and what makes them so powerful? So options are not only a valuable to in almost every real estate investing transaction, but often they are the best tool among all the tools you can use as a creative deal maker. As I told you earlier, options are a part of almost every deal Kim and I do. And I can't think of the last time we did a deal where some sort of option work was not involved. So at the same time, options are the least understood and least used tool in real estate. And I, I'm going to kind of, I said at the beginning of the thing, I was going to wait on this, but I'm going to touch on this. I talked to my, my friend, Robert Raskin, um, at Peace McDonald's about a month ago. And I asked that question, you know, why don't more people use options? And he said something I hadn't thought of before. And it was really good. He said, you know, when someone's teaching how to wholesale or how to flip, people, you know, inv would be investors can see immediate money, immediate return, you know, immediate cash in the bank, something they can go use and buy something with a car or another house or a vacation or whatever. He said, but with options, that's a long-term thing. That's a long hold play. And most investors don't think long-term. They're thinking, you know, two weeks, a month from now, they're not thinking a long time. But again, on the option deal I just showed you, that was a long time play for us. That's called a strategic option, long-term thought process. We were let it, we, we've let it built up in value over time. And no, I didn't take the cash when I could have sold the property. But now the value is much, much higher than we're going to end up making a lot more money than we would have if we had just sold the property. So I thought Robert was really good on that, uh, that answer. And here's another another part of that. Um, Pete Fortunato and Dice Botterford and Kim and me did a cruise for eight years. It was called the Captures of the Deal Cruise. And when, when the people got on the boat, and there was a lot of strong, seasoned investors on this boat. And about 200 people attended um, each year. And we would ask them to, we would ask them as they got on the boat, the first question we ask is, how many doors do you own or control? And this group of 200 investors controlled roughly 53 to 5,400 doors. When I say there was a lot of experience on the, on the boat, that's what I mean. The second question we asked was, how many notes do, do you own or control? And the normal answer was about 2,300. So again, a lot of lenders, a, a, a lot of lenders, a lot of loans uh, from this group of 200. But here's the kicker. I asked the question, how many options do you own or control? And they all, the answer was never more than 110, 110. So 5,500 doors, 2,300 uh, notes, 110 options. And if you took out the options that Dice held and I held and Pete held, it was down to almost single digits. And that always floored me because there were a lot of Millerites that were on the boat. And I think Robert kind of hit it on the head that, People want a really fast, quick turnaround of money, but they're 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 picking up the pennies and they're they're leaving dollars on the floor. So I don't really understand that. Um, final thought on this is if you're if you're an investor and again you're looking for a, a, a two weeks, four weeks down the road, then options will not be for you. This is not a tool that you want to use or work with or learn about. Go learn other things because they'll be really good for you. you know, flipping and wholesaling. <clears throat> Go do those things. But um, options will not are not the best tool that you can use and not a good use of your time to learn about. But if you're someone who's thinking down the road, then and this kind of appeals to you, you're listening to this going, wow, you know, that makes a whole lot of sense. Then, yeah, then options are for you. And one of the best things of all is you have almost no competition. Everywhere I go, most investors I talk to, I mean, they 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 may understand lease options, probably not, but all the other things options do, like the deal you just saw, no clue. And so that means I'm in rarefied air and I'm able to do deals that nobody else can do. It, it slips right past them. 
So an option is a great advanced deal structuring tool you can use whether you're buying or you're selling or you're renting or you're speculating. So I've used options in all four of these areas of real estate investing. So simply put, an option, what it is, is it's a right to buy a property rather than an obligation to buy. So if you do a purchase and sale agreement with a realtor you're, and everybody signed and the contingencies have all passed, that's an obligation to buy. Now, both parties have to perform. It is a, it's a bilateral contract. But when you have the right to, when, when the seller is obligated to sell to you, but you're not obligated to buy from them, then that's called a unilateral contract. And said a different way, it's a case where you can buy, but it's not where you must buy. And can buy is much, much safer than must buy. Options allow you to control a property's gain and a property's cash flow without ownership. The, the two main documents, the two main tools that you can use to work with property that you don't actually own are going to be a lease agreement and an option agreement. And when you use both the lease agreement, like a master lease, and you use an option agreement combined with that, so you have the right to use the property and you have the right to buy that property sometime down the line for a pre-agreed to price, pre-agreed to terms. Holy cow, that's powerful. So an option allows you to control a property for little or no money. And there's been many options that we've gotten, not for any money I paid, but instead for something I did. So a good example, one of the deals that you'll see in the next two weeks is when we sold our horse ranch. So we sold our $500,000 horse ranch for $300,000. And you're thinking crazy, but wait till you hear the whole story. But the thing is, we sold the, our $500,000 horse ranch for $300,000, but we got the right to buy the ranch back anytime over the next, I think it was 40 years, for $300,000. The consideration for the option was, I agreed to sell the seller our house for $200,000 below value. So it's not like I paid him for the option. It's just I agreed to do something. In this case, I agreed to sell our ranch for way below value. So now here's a biggie. An option is not a loan. And this is probably how I use options most often. Uh, as I say that, I don't, I don't think that's true, but that might be true. It's going to be close. So it can't be overstressed how important this one benefit is for both the property owner who's granting the option, as well as a real estate investor acquiring an option. So let me put this in English for you. Um, if you're if you're driving through a neighborhood, and if you see a gutter hanging down, and let's say um, you know it's just kind of hanging there, and there's a tree leaning into the house, and you stop and you you knock on the door and you found you're like, why is there a gutter hanging down? And why is there a roof leaning against the house? And maybe they don't have the money to fix it. Well, what if the owner would give you the right to buy their property at a pre-agreed to price, pre-agreed to terms. If you agree to put a new gutter up and have the tree removed from the house. Now remember, they didn't have the money to pay someone to come out and do that. But if you did those two things in return, you would get the right to buy their property at a pre-agreed pre pre -agreed to price and terms. And that is not a loan. So they don't owe you money back. It's almost like they sold their couch to you and you now have the couch and they now have money. Now they're going to pay you the money back. You have the couch. In this case, the couch is the right to buy the property at some point in the future. And they have the money that you gave them or whatever it is you did for them of value. And that's theirs to keep. So it is not a loan. One of the biggest ways options are valuable more than anything else is they're a title flaw. So when you have them secured to the property using a mortgage or a deed of trust, when they're secured to the property, the, if the homeowner tries to get a loan, they're not able to. If they go to try to sell the property, they're not able to because this option sits there and think of it like a title flaw. So you can think 
So can you think of any other creative deal structuring tool in your creative deal structuring toolbox that can do all these things? And the answer is no. An option is the only tool that does these things. That's what makes options so special. That's what makes them so doggone powerful. So now the question becomes, who will give you an option? How do you go find options? So most option work is done with two types of property owners, at least for me and Kim. The first one is someone who does not want to sell their property. And you're about to see an example of that deal. But someone who does not want to sell their property. The second way we use it most often is someone who needs money but can't get a loan. So example is the gutters, or they need a new roof, or they need a new car, or there's they need to get moved, or they need to pay a hospital bill, or they got to pay down their credit cards. There's lots of, lots of reasons why people need money, and they just can't get a loan. So I'm not going to lend them the money, especially if they're an owner-occupant, because of Dodd-Frank. However, I will buy something from them. In this case, it's the right to buy the property at some point in the future. So let me show you an example of someone who they, they could not afford to pay their bills and how we did the option work. So this property is on William Street in, um, in Cartersville. And in this case, the owner could not afford their property taxes. So I was at just at door knocking. There's no sign in the yard. House is not for sale. I just happen to be going through a neighborhood that I work on a regular basis. And when the, when the owner came to the door, I said, you know, I love your house. I love your street. I love your neighborhood. My wife and I would love to own, own a home here. Do you know of anybody who's thinking about selling? And he said, yeah, me. I'm going to probably have to sell my house. And the way he said it, you could tell he didn't want to sell. He just, I got, I got to sell my house. And I said, why? why? Why do you have to sell your house? And he said, I can't afford to pay the property taxes anymore. You know, when my wife and I bought our, this house, it was our forever home. And I'm about five years away from paying off the mortgage and having it free and clear. But property taxes have gone up so much. I, I just can't afford them anymore. And let me ask you, where you live, what have property taxes done? What has insurance done? Nothing but skyrock, sky, skyrocket, right? How many people have this exact problem. They don't want to sell, but they can't afford to live in their home anymore. Let me show you how you can work a structure where you both win. And I said, well, do you want to sell? And the seller said, no, I don't want to sell. I know this is my forever home. I don't want to sell. And I said, you know, would you trade me a glass of sweet tea? If I could show you how you could keep your home and never pay property taxes again. If that was you, don't you think you'd be interested? Would you want to hear more about that? Might you invite me in and we sit at the kitchen table and have a glass of sweet tea? Maybe. He did. And this is called a T-bar. And a T-bar is the most important document I use in real estate investing. This is what I'm using when I sit at a seller's kitchen table. So on the left-hand side, I list down at the top the current position. In other words, where they are now, where it hurts, what's going on. On the right-hand side is a potential position. So if they will accept my offer, whatever my offer is going to be, and I don't know what it's going to be yet, but whatever it is, I'm going to help them move to a better situation. Uh, they're, they're going to like their potential position better than where they are right now. So in this case, when I was sitting at the table, these are the things he said to me. He doesn't want to sell right now. Um, his property taxes are too high. And I asked him, I said, why don't you fight your property taxes? He goes, I never learned how. You know, you can't fight City Hall. Well, it turns out you can fight City Hall. I've been doing it since 2006. Now, I've gotten really good at it. And he said, we can't pay to afford to pay our property taxes anymore. And he said, we really don't want to move. So these are the points where he it hurts him. These are the things that need to get solved. And I said, so I'm thinking to myself, as he says, I don't want to sell right now. I just do an arrow to the right-hand side of the paper, and I wrote down, you don't have to sell right now. I didn't say this to him. This is what I'm saying to me. This is people always ask, how do I know how to creatively structure a deal? And the answer is the seller tells me. This is the seller telling me what needs to be done. Property taxes are too high. And I thought to myself, I know how to lower your property taxes. Left-hand side, I don't know how to fight my property taxes. Right-hand side, I've been fighting property taxes for 20 years. Left-hand side, I can't afford to uh, pay our property taxes. Right-hand side, you never have to pay your property taxes again. Left-hand side, we don't want to move. Right-hand side, you don't have to move. So whatever offer I come up with, 
I've got to make the right side happen. And if my offer allows the right side to happen, do you see that there's a really good chance that they're going to accept my offer? And that's what happened here. So the fair market value of this property was 175. And the way I found out is I asked him, what do you think your house is worth? He goes, about 175. Most people know the value of their homes. And I said, you know, I'm going to fight your property taxes from now on. I won't charge you for it. It's just what I do. From now on, I fight your property taxes. Also, from now on, as long as you live here, I'll pay your property taxes. You never had to pay your property taxes again. Now, do you see that just with these two things, especially the second thing, do you see that that's going to allow him to stay in his house? So whatever comes next, if he really wants to stay, stay in his house, do you see that the chances of him accepting my offer are great? And I said, in return, I want you to give me a 30-year option to buy your house for $175,000. So he's already told me the value. So he's captured all that property's appreciation up to today, up to 175. But moving forward, however much else it goes up, I get to capture that. And then one question, one thing I said for him is, listen, I'll be paying your property taxes, but there's going to come a time to pay the piper. So for every dollar I pay in property taxes, I want a dollar fifty off the strike price. A strike price in option terminology is the purchase price. So for every dollar I spend, I get a dollar fifty off the hundred seventy-five thousand dollars strike price. And he wanted to stay in the house, and you saw this with the last deal. And I said, "About how long?" He goes, "Probably at least ten years, you know, before we will move down to Florida or something." And so I said, "Okay, we, we're going to have the thirty-year option, but we'll agree not to exercise it for the first ten years." And this is the deal. So let's go back. Look at it. I mean, this is the T-bar told me what I needed to do. The T-bar told me how to structure the deal. And the owner gave me the T-bar. That's why the T-bar is so important to me. So William Street, again, is another long-term option for me. And the owner doesn't want to sell right now. And for me, it's just, I'm thinking of this, it's going to be a long-term hold but it's a very great, it's a perfect deal for a self-directed retirement account because those things, you know, linger. This is whether it's your your self-directed retirement account or maybe somebody else you know, but these, you know, you, you want long-term investments in your retirement accounts. So now let's look at this deal today. <clears throat> the fair market value on this property has gone up to $240,000. My Roth has paid out $4,800 in property taxes. The strike price is now 168. Remember, I told you the strike price was 175, but I get a dollar fifty off for every dollar I paid. So our strike price is lowered down to 167.8. So this option for 4,800 dollars now controls 7,200 dollars in equity, and it will be 10 years. Will be coming up in um, 2030. Now, question you may have is, what if he doesn't want to move in 2030? Then let's sit down and talk. Let's have a conversation. And if I'm willing to go longer in the option, might he be willing to reduce down the strike price or maybe give owner financing or something? And the answer is, yeah, that's just a conversation we'll have down the road. So the $4,800 is, is generated $7,200 of equity. It's not in my account, but of equity. But when I go to exercise my option, this will be tax-free funds in our retirement accounts. So what's the return on this one? 69.72% yearly return. Not bad, huh? Better than the 10% I was making on the last property you saw. So what will this deal look like, do you think, six years from now when 2030 rolls around? Let's say they have moved. You know, they, they are ready to move. What will this deal look like? Pretty good? Yeah, a great deal. Could I have done it if I didn't know how to do options? The answer is no. So who will give you an option? Um, there are three other ways that Kim and I use options. So I'll use options when I want to protect one of our free and clear properties. This is called a porcupine option. And I'll go more into this, I think, on uh, the third deal school. And when we want to buy a property that will require a lot of time, effort, and money before buying it, I'm going to use an option. And a lot of you have gotten the, 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 the write-up that Kim sent out about a property we're closing on in Tampa the end of this week or beginning of next. So this deal is going on right now. And I had a purchase and sale to start back in October, and I switched it over to a secured option because to get this deal to work, the property taxes had to be paid before, and they were in arrears, 
and the property was going to a property tax auction on December the 21st, 2023. And those arrears had to be paid before December the 21st, or the property would be, she would lose the property, couldn't sell it to me. But for me to pay the back property taxes, which was over $13,000 before I owned it, I had to have much better security. So I switched from a purchase and sale to a four. I think it's either the 30, 40, or 50-year option. I got to go back and look. But I have the right to buy this property for the $175,000. So not bad, huh? And we also use it when we want to buy a property, and we're just unsure of the property's cash flow. I'm unsure if 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 it's going to go, the, the area's going to go commercial, or if the area's going to improve. When I'm unsure about something, then you can, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar. I probably will use a lease, a master lease with an option before I'm going to go buy the property and get the deed. So again, if I'm not sure, you can count on me not getting the deed on that property. So most of our door knocking options are found by knocking on homeowners' doors. So where do we knock? I have a, you know, I always had a five mile circle. I worked a five mile circle around the Carsville, Georgia Walmart. And that's where most of our option, option work got done. But I will tell you something else. I'm now down in Florida. We're down in the Venice area. And last week, I've been wanting to do this for two or three years now, is to go out and make a thousand written offers and take a picture of each offer recorded so people can see what it's like and what it takes to be a real estate investor. Well, that started last week. And I made 10 offers, 10 written offers last week. But uh, as I go out and make a thousand written offers, all from door knocking, you can bet that a number of those offers, a percentage of those offers, will not me be not will not me me will not be me trying to buy the house. It will be me trying to buy an option on the property because that's more suited to whatever the seller's uh, needs are. And if you want to follow me, you can. Uh, I'll be posting a video. So I'm going to be grouping offers in groups of 25. So one through 25, 26 through 50. Um, 51 through 75 and turning that into a video and then posting the video up on our website at Billing Kim Cook. Um, might be something you want to watch. Who knows? Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you'll go knock on a door. Maybe you'll go meet with a seller, sit at the kitchen table. So we'll see what happens. The first video will drop toward the end of next week. So what's the best way to secure an option? And a lot of people were told the best way to secure an option is to use like a memorandum of option. And I'll learn this from Pete Fortunato, one of the most important lessons I ever learned from him, which is don't use a memorandum. We use mortgages in Florida in a mortgage state and a, and a judicial foreclosure state, or we use deeds of trust in a non-judicial foreclosure state, but we secure the option of the property. I'm going to talk about more about securing in either the second or third class, but I just want you all to know that's how we secure our options. And you'll see the mortgage I used to secure the option on the property in Tampa. And we did that, I think, on uh, November the 28th, 2023. So about a month and a half ago. So how do you exercise an option? And the answer is I'm doing it right now. So as I buy this property in Tampa, I'm not buying it from a purchase and sale agreement. I'm actually buying it from an option agreement. So I'm exercising my option. The terms of the sale are in the option agreement, which I've had to modify, by the way. And that's what I sent to the closer to say, here are the terms of the sale. So you'll be able to see that. And I know that when we teach um, the options course on April 2nd and 3rd, um, this property we're doing in Tampa, all the paperwork will now be part of the manual. And it's a real, real interesting um, deal. And again, read the write-up Kim sent out, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, it's a little bit long, but it helps you understand that this thing has lots of moving parts going on. And I never would have done this deal if I could not have used an option. I would have walked from it. Promise you I would have walked from it. I had to use an option to make it work. So how do you sell a property using an option? And this is the one most of us know. And a lot of times you're going to lease the property to someone who's going to use the property, a tenant. And then you're going to give them the right to buy it at some point in the future. Um, call it a lease option. Um, most, a lot of investors that have been around for a little bit heard of, maybe not have or used, but have heard of lease options. So as we bring this to a close, again, we're going to be teaching our options seminar on February uh, 3rd and 4th. It's going to be in Tampa, Florida, but you can come either in person or via Zoom. But know this, the room, in-person room, always sells out. 
and we're close to selling the room out now. So that will sell out in Tampa. Um, we have a room block that I think ends on February, it ends on January 18th. And so you really want to be in the hotel because you want to spend as much time with other investors as you can. And I always would stay in the hotel where the, wherever the seminar was um, because I wanted to be around other investors at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's kind of like the seminar, after the seminar, before the seminar, is spending time with other investors. And yes, this will be recorded. So probably about two weeks after the seminar is over with, everybody will be receiving a link to a video of the full two-day seminar. And the normal price uh, for our class is $6.97, but we're running an early bird special. So the price is uh, going to be $5.97. And that goes up on January the 28th, but we'll love to have you be a part of it. And you can bring a guest for $3.97. And for those of you that are attending, have already attended our, our Power of Options course before, you already know that um, you get in at $3.97. And to register... Simply go to our website at billingkimcook.com. And um, when you're there, you'll see how you'll see the the button, the big red button. I love big red buttons, a where to go to uh, get signed up. Just know that the in-person is going to sell out. And we have room on Zoom, obviously, because it's Zoom and the room block will fill and it's close to being full now. But we'll love to have you be a part of this. So if you saw something that you liked, if something about options appealed to you, because for a lot of you, it didn't. And that's okay. It's a good tool. Maybe one day down the road, you're going to look at that and say, yeah, let me let me learn about that now. That's fine. But for some of you, you've watched this and you thought, man, I, I can use options. And again, I'm just scratching the surface tonight. We're, we're barely touching all the things options can do. We're going to give more information next week and then more information the week after that. And it's going to floor you all the things that options can do. So the question is, you know, when do you start? And the thing is, you're paying for the options already. Whether you take the course or not, you're already paying for the options. Think of all the option deals that you could have done that you haven't done. Think of all the future option deals you could do that you won't be able to do. Not knowing how to use options can be much more expensive than actually coming to the course itself. And as I told you, I took options the first time in 1999 and I went to every Jack Miller options seminar he taught for the next 10 years. And I'm grateful for it. So what would you get? What you'll do, what you'll get from our seminar is first of all, we've been doing it for more than 20 years and you're going to see a lot of our deals that will be in the manual. And you're, we're going to be doing the deal school. You've already know we're going to get that. And then there's going to be a two day in-depth Again, this is the seminar that's going to be recorded. The manual is going to be probably at 300 pages or a little bit over. And it's chock full of information and deals along with all my contracts and the way I've done the deals. And then I write up of what was said and how. why do they say yes? Why didn't they say yes? And again, you can attend. If you can't uh, show up in person, you can attend on Zoom. So love to have you be a part of it. We're now about three minutes away. And I'll take a few minutes. If anybody has any questions... You're welcome to unmute. Karen. And I'll Hi, be here. Hello. Let, me, yeah. let, me, let me stop share. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. I just want to say thank you for doing this. I don't think anyone is out here doing, um, you know, bring awareness to options. So thank you for doing this and your time. Um, I want to go back kind of to the guy that was selling his home that uh, you that couldn't pay taxes. Just to understand, you were paying his taxes through your IRA, but yes. I didn't catch where you said that it was tax free. Because it's a Roth IRA. One day right now, I'm not it's not tax free. But one day when I exercise my option and buy this property, then any proceeds that I get will go into my Roth IRA and that will be tax free. Gotcha. So the proceeds that you get from selling the property will go into your IRA. Yeah. Cause I don't, own, I don't own it. My IRA <laughs> owns the option. I do not own the option. Understood. Okay. okay. That's okay. Amazing. Thank you. Hey, Karen, how do oh. I, know you? Karen, how do I know you? 
Um, through I, I've been to the Denny's. Um, oh, yes, yeah, how I know you were yes. in Denny's, the, the little the, the the coffee meetup group we did in Carswell when we were up there. Yes, I just haven't been able to go because I, I started a new company, a property management company, so it takes my time on Tuesdays. But next month I'll be less less busy, so I'll see you at the at the class for sure. I'm looking forward to just so you know, my Spanish is doing beautifully. Muy bien, gracias. I mean, me, me encanta. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, Richard. Bill, uh, Richard has a call. I mean, Bill, a uh, back to your slide where you said, "What's the best way to secure an option?" Was your answer a mortgage or a deed of trust? Or well, it depends, mortgage, it depends right? on. What, so let's just call it a mortgage because that's the the word we're used to using. And again, I have a bunch of secured options that I teach in my class. But I learned this from Pete Fortunato and it's probably the when it comes to options, it was one of the most important lessons I learned from him because I never thought. Let's, let's deep dive into this. I always thought a mortgage or a deed of trust was the purpose of it was to secure a note, period, a promissory note. So if you right. borrow money from Bank of America to go buy a house, they will secure the promissory note to the property with a mortgage or deed of trust. So if you don't pay, they're going to call the note due. And if you still don't pay, they give us them the right to foreclose. What Pete taught us was a mortgage or deed of trust secures a promise. Any promise. Let me say that again. Any promise. I didn't know that. An option is a promise. A purchase and sale agree is a, a, a purchase and sale agreement is a promise. If you promise to, to 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 clean my house once a week, I can secure that promise against your property. In other words, if you don't clean my house once a week, you're giving me the right to to foreclose on your house and take your house from you. So the mortgage secures a promise, and the property becomes the collateral for the promise. Okay, does that help? Yes. Yes. Uh that it uh, secures any promise. Now you're talking about the uh, um, option. Correct. It's just, okay. just the mortgage and the or the deed of trust have to be worded so, so you know that it's securing an option and not a promissory note. The That's special all. wording. Right. And then on the option, or the, on, you know, they both have to be witnessed and signed so they're able to be recorded in the courthouse. So every okay. state's a little bit different on that. In Georgia... We have to have um, two witnesses and and a and a and a um, notary, and one of the witnesses can be the notary. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Bill. Sure, Tony. Tony, you um, <clears throat> uh, borrow against the option and use the option as collateral. Is the option as collateral something that institutional lenders understand? You know, like. No. Oh no, not not even a little bit. So I, don't, it's, you know, I don't even think a pawn shop would understand it. Another investor would understand it. Okay. And that's about it. And so you know, I've never borrowed against an option I hold, but um I did need money for a house and I used Elm Street, a property we have in uh, Daresville, Georgia. And I sold an option to Joan Stewart, who was my next door neighbor. So she purchased an option on my property for, I think it was $95,000 because I needed fast cash and didn't have it. And I used that $95,000 to buy the motorhome that if you look in the background and see Kim, Kim is in the motorhome right now. That's where I got the funds to buy that house because I needed to have cash within a day. And so I said, Joan, how would you like to buy an option on my property? And the property is worth $200,000, and she had the right to buy it for $95,000. Now, I also got an option to buy back the option. So there was two, two options done. I know that's a little bit confusing, but that's where I got the money to buy the motorhome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Jesse. Hey, Bill. Nice um, hat. I talked to you. What's that? Nice hat. Oh, thanks. I talked to you in February uh, about a property I, I was buying in Sylvania, Georgia, 22 acres with a with a seven bedroom house on it. Um, anyway, so I did get that, and I now live in Florida, uh, Georgia. And, Congratulations! Um, thank you. So my question is: there's a 
a little a little pocket of houses in in an area around here that um is a pretty pretty interesting little village i guess you could say there's about 50 houses and my plan is to try to get a, an option or i don't know what the term would be on as many of those houses as i can so how would that work i would tell you to I want you to give me a phone call so we can talk to it about it in details because I've got a million questions for you. Okay. So this is a specific deal sort of thing and we need to talk offline on that. But okay. in order for this to be a very valuable deal, you need to be able to buy all the properties, right? Yes. Well, so, yes. Yeah. But I'd like to at least a, a lot of them, yes. A lot of them. So what I would do is go and try to get an option on as many of those properties as I can. So in other words... I'm not locked into buying, but they are locked into selling to me. Right, right. And then once I have the options in place, if I if I think now I've got enough options, it's worth it to me, then I can exercise the options about the property. What you want to do is you want to read about how they built Disney World. I have. That's what gave me the yeah, idea. It's the yeah. same thing. So Disney, yeah. before Disney World was Disney World, they sent out people and the word Disney wasn't used anywhere. Right. And the, the, some some people that were working for Disney came out and got options on big chunks of land all over right. the Orlando area. Right. And once they had all the properties they need optioned, then it was extra. It was assigned to Disney. The option got assigned to Disney, and then Disney exercised the option and bought the property and said, "Oh, by the way, we're bu building a Disneyland here." And everybody's looking around, going, "What?" Yes. If, if we would have known that, we wouldn't have sold the the land. Absolutely. At the price, right. And I read a story just last week, I think it was, about a family that actually had one of those properties. And then when they found out it was Disney, it was like this, you know, big surprise. And, oh, yeah, we would have asked for more and all that. Well, yeah. you know what, Jesse? You're about to become Mickey Mouse. Yes, I'm, Mouse. I'm ready. You'll be Minnie Mouse. So there you go. I'm ready. <laughs> and I, one, it's going to be a fun deal. One second. I want Teresa Willis. I just saw her face. I want Ter Teresa Willis to uh, unmike or Mike. I want to be able to talk to Teresa. Ting, ting. Ting, ting. And then hi. you've got three calls. I'll get, I'll get there. I want to talk to Ting, ting. Hands. That's fine. Ting, ting. Where's Ting, ting? Ting, ting. Teresa. Oh, she may have just dropped off. Oh. I'm here. Oh. Teresa! Ding, hey, ding! Phil. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you also. I don't see you, but I know you're there. Um, when you were getting started with investing, I want you all to know that if there was ever a reason for someone to quit, Teresa went through it a bunch of times and refused. And Teresa, I want to ask you why I have you, you know, everybody here listen to you. And especially like with, with McKin McKinsey, is it is it McKinsey King? Is that last name is King? McKinsey is your first name. Yes, McKinsey okay. is my first name. Last name is King. Okay, McKinsey, I want you to listen to this. So okay. McKinsey is like, you know, 19 years old or 18 years old or 12, something like that. But he's young and <laughs> he hasn't really been through the grinder. And I want him to get into investing, but not quit. So Teresa, what made you not quit? What made you continually persevere and never, never quit? What What is it that, what keeps you going? Bill, because, okay, I, um, I was never a good student when I was at school. And however, I, um, I, uh, I, when I learned about or when I saw real estate uh, investing by reading uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book, um, it, it just, I, 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 I like this business. Oh, be, not because the, the, um, the potential, it just uh, fits my personality. Um, and um, I, I, I love, people um first and um i just i i i like real estate so even it's a, this business it's 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 a simple but it's not easy um 
Um, so I just, I wanted to. Well said. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's a hard um, because I, I, I learned from Bill um, about 10 years ago and I don't mind door knocking um, in um, a lot of time. And I have the mindset that um, the doors I, I, I knock um, usually are people or homeowner, they're in trouble. <clears throat> and um, sometimes I, I, when I get scared, but I will, I will, I will tell myself that I, I know how to. I'm going to cry. I, I know ways or um to help owners. So I, 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 I need to help them. Um, because I learned from Bill, it the uh, being a real estate investor is not to make money. We're we're a problem solver. So it just it kept me going. Um, sometimes when I um when door knocking and I saw um like there are um they they are vacant or they already being foreclosed I feel sad and I I just uh, um I I I just feel like okay I I I should have come earlier so that I could I was able to help the owner I don't know if I answer your question Teresa I, Teresa you did in spades. <laughs> and I just want you to know when Teresa went to college, you know, Mackenzie, she was in Tennessee, but she learned, you know, she spoke Chinese. <laughs> it's, it's Mandarin, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. She spoke Mandarin. She's from Taiwan. And um, so she had taken English there, but needless to say, the English that they speak in Taiwan is not exactly the English they speak in Tennessee. Right, a little bit of a difference, a little bit more twang <laughs> there in Tennessee. Yes. And she still did that. And when she door knocks, you can, you can. She has every reason to not door knock, every reason to not go meet with sellers, <clears throat> and yet she goes and does that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing the thousand written offers. I just want people to see what it takes to succeed. And it's, it's she said it best. Real estate investing is a very simple business. We go out and we find people to help and prompts us off, but it's anything but easy. So I just wanted to, I wanted y'all to hear from her because I just love her so much and she's <laughs> such an inspiration to me. So Brandon, you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Ting Ting. I love you, Bill. Love, love you, you too, Kim. <laughs> uh, actually, I love you too, honey. Clay's Clay? been waiting um, a Hi, long Clay. time. So if we could catch him real fast. Yeah, go ahead, Clay. Hey, Bill, thanks a whole lot for sharing hey, tonight and uh, doing your class. You're always great. Uh, met with Ari, uh, um, Ari Newman. Newman, in yeah, one, one very smart real estate investor. Yeah, and that's why I'm on tonight because he re he reminded me. I uh, went to his uh, uh, meeting with he taught yesterday and uh, he reminded me about this course. So, uh, I so you know, my, you my, opinion of, my opinion of Ari is extremely high. He and I have been friends for a while, and I really like him a lot. You're you're with a really good guy, and yeah. Ari does some really good deals. He thinks things through. Is we just did a deal together not too long ago, and there were a couple of things, a couple of mistakes I made in the in, in the paperwork, and Ari found them. So hats off to him. So you're with a really good guy you can trust. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having an ally here in Georgia uh, with him. So my question is, uh, you mentioned, uh, so if we have an option, it's secured uh, by a deed of trust or mortgage. Let's say there's, when it's secured, there's already a, a primary mortgage in place in first position. I guess then the option uh, mortgage or deed of trust becomes second or third Correct. or whatever no, position. So, you know, whatever, whatever it is in position. So it's, what happens in a foreclosure situation? What if they just stop paying their primary mortgage and it goes to foreclosure? What happens with your option? Great, great question. It's something you want to track. And so one of the things that I want to get with my option is I want to have the right to, and usually I'm going to use a, a power of attorney to be able to go and look at their account online if there's something senior to my option, which usually there is. Usually there's a mortgage or sometimes two mortgages in place and I'm in third position. But again, there's a lot of potential there and I'm willing to roll the dice on it. But I want to be able to go check. Also, I check and make sure they paid their property taxes. And I also want to be listed on the insurance policy 
Um, so if they quit paying their insurance, I get notified. Make sense? Uh, okay. Yeah, it does. But so that means like regularly once a year or more, you're checking all your options and my, looking uh, into uh, about four, about three times a year, twice a year, something like that. Um, but remember when I'm back home, I, I usually drive by and talk to them, knock on the door. How are you doing? Just seeing how things are going. So it's not like I disappear. I'm easy to find. Okay. But technically <clears throat> if it goes to foreclosure, I'll get I mean, wiped if out. they, yeah, you get, I get wiped out. Wiped out. Think, think of it this way. Let's say I bank of America had a first mortgage and I'm, I'm, third, fifth bank, whatever that's, whatever that thing is called, third, fifth bank. And I'd made a loan, um, a home equity line of credit loan for $50,000. And the first Bank of America forecloses. I'm wiped out. I'm in junior position. And a foreclosure will wipe out everything junior except for like a federal tax lien. And well, even taxes. if it sells, if, it, if at the auction it sells for more than the balance of the first, then the second gets paid something, right? Yeah, it can get paid uh, something, but I wouldn't count on that. And if you have an option, I mean, you you have the right to get paid and they just figure, I mean. Well, let, I, let, me, let me tell you what I do can... instead. So let's say, let's use the one that you just saw where I have an option to buy a property for $170,000. And let's say I said I will not exercise my option for 15 years. That's what I said, right? That's the option. But in my option agreement, it also says that if they fall delinquent on their account, I can exercise my option immediately and buy the property subject to any mortgage they have. How about them, Alex? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, that's I'm, good I'm, I'm going to buy it with built-in financing, and then I'll catch up the arrears and stop the foreclosure. That's good. Good language. So as long as you have that language in there and you yes. catch it before it actually goes to foreclosure, you're good. Yeah, um, and the option you'll get it, your... the option you'll get at my February class, that language is in there. I have that language in my option agreement. Okay, great. Thanks sure. a lot. Sure. Brandon. I'm confused how you record these options. Is it just something you take to the bank? And then also how you record it in your IRA? Are you just using your IRA name on the document that says that now your IRA is going to be the one paying your taxes or paying that guy's taxes for your that example you used earlier? Let me, and then let's, I guess you would. Wait, wait, hang on one second. Dude. Let's, let's handle yeah. one question at a time. So let's back up first. And let's say I have an option on your property. My IRA is not involved. Let's keep it simple in the first one, okay? Okay. So let's say you need a new roof, $10,000. I agree to put a new roof on your house and you agree to give to, to, to grant me an option to buy your property sometime in the next 20 years, pre-agreed to price and terms, right? Right. Okay. So we're going to go to an attorney's office, not the bank. We're going to go to an attorney's office because we use attorneys in Georgia and they use title companies. I'm closing with my very first title company, mm -hmm. the house in Tampa with Sue Ann, because there's title companies down here. They don't use attorneys or if they do. I don't know that much about them. I'm just using Sue Ann. Okay. So when we're at the attorney's office, you're going to sign an option granting me the right to buy your house at some point in the future, pre-agreed to price and terms, right? right. The next thing you're going to sign is going to be a mortgage. Okay. It's going to get witnessed and notarized. Now that's yeah. going to be recorded in the courthouse. Okay. So okay. that's taken to the courthouse. And it's recorded. Now, I say that to say this. When I got an option on, I think it was November 28th, on the on the house in Tampa, <clears throat> I went down to the courthouse and I used a mortgage to record the option. I have never record, used an option, a mortgage, in Florida before. And I've never recorded an option in Florida before. And so I went to the nice lady at the window she looked at me and she said, okay, we have to figure out what the intangible tax is. In other words, an intangible tax is charged when a mortgage is filed to be recorded and the intangible tax is based on the amount of the loan. I'm recording an option. Is there any loan? Nope. No. She said, that makes no sense. 
there's always intangible tax. I said, no, ma'am, there's not intangible tax, always. This is not a loan. Do you see that it says option? I have the right to buy it, but I'm not, no money was borrowed. And she said, no, no, you have to have intangible tax on a mortgage. You have to. And in this case, your option is to buy it for $175. So that's going to be, it was like $900. You have to pay the $900. I said, no, ma'am. Can you please get a supervisor? I went up four levels of supervisors, an hour and a half, right? Wow. Hey, this is what happens. And I was very nice. I didn't get upset. I understand that it's going to take me going up four or five levels before I talk to someone who knows what they're mm -hmm. talking about. But you don't want to be like Pete Fortunato. Pete would have stopped at the first person and said, excuse me, does any incompetent person or does any competent person work here? And can I talk True. to you? True. Don't say that. That's a really bad yeah. idea. <laughs> so I was very nice, went up four layers, and they finally found someone who came up and, you know, of course, you know, gray hair, been there a long time and said, no, he's right. This isn't a loan when he buys it. And if he gets a loan, then there'll be intangible tax. And they're like, but mortgages have to have intangible tax. He said, no, only when there's a loan. Yeah, there is a loan. Look, 175. No, no, he has the right to buy it. So this hour and a half, but I did get the option recorded and I will show you the option probably uh, week two or week three. You'll see the option that I used in this and the more part of the option that I used and the mortgage I used to, to secure with. But understand the first time I went to record <coughs> option in Georgia, in my hometown in Bartow County, and I tried to record an option using a deed of trust, I went through the same ringer. I went through the same ringer. The same thing happened. And I had to go up, I had to end up talking to um, the county attorney before it got approved and they understood that I didn't have to pay intangible tax. And this just happened to me last year when I did an option on a, a mobile home park in Rome that I did a loan on with Melvin. And when I went to the Rome, I never, never done a deal in Rome before. So I went to go record the, the option. I was an hour in there talking different levels up. I went up three different levels before someone said, no, he's, he's right about this. So understand that they, they've never seen it in most cases, an option being secured with um, a mortgage or a deed of trust. You're just going to have to work through that. Yeah, Andy. Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming you have language in there when you said you can also have the option to buy for a mortgage balance. You probably that, that, have that language is, in yeah, it. It's different wording. So there's different ways you buy a property. So it may say for 175. It may say for the then balance of the mortgage. It may be it may be based on a formula. You know, whatever the fair market value is at the time I purchased the, the property. There's not one way to determine the option price. You have to talk to the other person, the the the, the property owner. And that's where you that's how you determine how we'll buy this thing. So I guess what my real question is, how do you prevent them from getting another quarter million dollar home equity line of credit before you exercise that option? Or great, that you would great, be notified. Great question, Andy. So let me ask you a question. Let's say you had a first mortgage on your home. It looks like you have a very nice home. So you have a first mortgage on your home and it's for two hundred thousand dollars. OK, and they're going to use a North Carolina, North Carolina, I believe, is a mortgage state, correct? OK, so you have a mortgage securing that Bank of America loan to your property. Now, you go down to. Um, what's another bank? Um, Truist. Covia. Tru Truist. You go, you go to Truist and you want to borrow two hundred thousand dollars. And they say, sure, you have good credit. No problem. When Truist goes and does her title work on your home, what will be found? What will the deed, deed dogs find in uh, the, the deeds records room? Existing mortgage plus a Existing mortgage. No, no, this is with the Bank of America note. So the, oh, okay. they're, they're going to see the existing Bank of America loan that you have. Now, once they see that and they realize they're going to be in second position, might they turn your loan down? Uh, 
Yes. And the other thing is the deed dog that yes. went into the, the deed dog that went and looked up that more than likely they're going to contact Bank of America just to get more information about the loan, right? Yeah. So when you see my option agreement, my phone number is all <laughs> over. When you see my yeah. mortgage or deed of trust, my phone number, big, right in the center of the document. So I get a phone call and usually the call goes like this. Hi, this is you know, so-and-so at the deed records room. And I was just double checking. We're going to need to know the payoff on your loan. Even though everything says option, I have never had them say, I need to find out about the option. They always say the same thing. We need to know what the payoff is on the loan. Because they're seeing a mortgage or they're seeing a deed of trust, they assume it's a loan and their job is to get now the payoff. And the payoff is the home equity, the existing equity? Well, no, but well, it, 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 with, with me, I'm like, there, there's no payoff. I have the right to buy the property. Is he thinking about selling it? Is he thinking about refinancing it? And so the person tells me, and then I pick up the phone and I call the person who gave me the option. Because remember, no, no, no. he can't say, no, I don't say no, 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 no. I just sit back and say, tell me what's going on. I'm all ears. Now he can't sell the property. Well, I can't say he can't sell the property to someone else. He can but if they buy it, they buy it subject to my option. In other words, my uh, option doesn't dissolve. I still that colors the title. I'm yeah, senior. Yeah. I'm senior to anything they did, and so I can still exercise my option to buy the property. And whoever the new buyer is says, "We want to. We, we won't do that. We don't want to honor the option." I can foreclose and take the property. Mm -hmm. No problem whatsoever. Got it. That help. That's great. That's is great. That, yes, that, thank that, you. Is, when, when you again, when you secure with an option or a deed of trust, you're securing your options. I've never had one closed over the top of. I've always gotten the phone call, always, and every time thus far, the questions has been, "What is the payoff on the on the note on the on the loan?" So they're not going to refinance or anything like that without they can't they you. can't because I'm in the way, and so whoever yeah. the lender is is going to need me to go in is going to need to be me to go in a junior position, which I may do. You know, let's let's say my option has three years left and they're willing to extend the option an additional 20 years. Might I agree to go into a junior position? Sure, maybe. Sure. If they refinance, are they going to get some cash? Yeah. Might they pay me something to in order for me to go into a junior position? Ah. Uh, ah. Nice. Nice. Got it. Don't you like That's that? That's great. That's fantastic. And McKenzie, Thank thanks, McKenzie, thanks for getting your parents to sign up for this class. They said that you signed them up. They didn't have too much of a choice. So thanks for that, buddy. Of course. I'm <laughs> I'm ready to learn it all. It's a little confusing to me, but I'm getting there piece by piece. And so, you know, when I sat through the first options course back in 99, I understood when Jack said, good morning. <laughs> Time for lunch. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And that's all that's that's all I understood. But I it is like learning a language. So when Ting Ting came to, to, to move to Tennessee to go to college, do you think she understood anything anybody was saying to her? No. She might have picked up a few words, but she learned. She do, she was persistent. She stayed with it. Mm -hmm. Bill, you have a question from chat. Ch chat? Chat. Chat. Oh, in chat. Uh, in the chat, yes. Jonathan wants to know, does the deed of trust show the details of the option or does it just state that there is an option? You do this one of two ways. So the, uh, the mortgage or the deed of trust has some basic information about the option. But one of the things I've, I do, and I've learned this from Pete, is you'll see on my documents that we'll look at next week or the week after, that on it, it says, um, see attachment B, see attachment A for the legal description of the property and see attachment B for a copy of the note, a copy of the option, a copy of the purchase and sale agreement. I record the full document with the mortgage or the deed of trust. And the reason why I do that is I always have a copy of it then. You got to remember, we live in a motorhome. And in the motorhome is a 100-gallon diesel tank. And if I ever hit something, there's going to be a very big fire. 
and all my documents, all my option work is going to just disappear in smoke. And I've told Kim, if this happens, don't worry about me. Don't worry about the computer. <laughs> the For God's sakes, get the <laughs> file box out of the rig. Save the file box and you'll be just fine. I can burn to death, but by God, get that file box out. But anyway, because all of our documents are recorded in the courthouse, we're okay. Because some of this recorded in the courthouse is considered an original document. Even though it's not an original document, you get a copy of it, it's still considered an original document. So that's why I do that. Cloud storage, Bill. You need to <laughs> learn about cloud storage. Yeah, I guess I do. I, I know then I got fireproof boxes, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I know, I know, but I don't. Bill, we've had a lot of people jump on right at eight o'clock or a little bit after. Um, maybe for next week, give the uh, time frames that we are actually in class. For the next, we're going to do this next Wednesday, which is the 17th, and then the following Wednesday, which will be the 24th of January. And we start at eight, and we, I'm no, sorry, start at no. seven. Start at seven. We end at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Eastern time. That's so the 7 p.m. Eastern to 8, 8 p.m. Eastern. 8 PM. Yes. And then we answer questions until everybody just gets tired. Well, not until but everybody you do gets have tired. Call to jump More on. than likely is until I get tired because there's there's another call I'm usually on from 8 to 9 on Wednesdays. Vin and I taught something called ultimate deal structuring for the last four years. And I, we're not going to teach it anymore, but we did it for four years. But we've had a group, a Zoom group that's been going on now for over three years every Wednesday night and they help each other and it's deal structuring It's from eight until nine. So I try to always be on that call, but you guys are more important tonight. So here we go. Thank you. But I appreciate that. Sure. Any more questions? I'm here. I want you all to follow. I want you all to follow my door knocking. You know, yeah. when, 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 when I get a lot of calls from a lot of investors and that they're not making it. And a lot of you have heard me say this many, many, many times. Anyway, so a lot of calls from a lot of investors, they're not making it. And I ask two questions, two. And I know exactly what's going on. The first question I ask is how many written offers you've made in the last 30 days? Guess what the answer is? Zero. Zero. Second question I get is how many written offers you've made in the last 12 months? And the answer is usually less than 10. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that because my goal was always 25 written offers a week. Now I'm not saying your goal should be 25 written offers a week. Um, but it has to be something where if I ask you how many offers you've made in the last 30 days, it better be one, two, three, four, five, you know, maybe, maybe 10. You've got to get the numbers up there. You got to be talking to people. So last week we made 10 written offers and my schedule uh, moving forward will be on Friday afternoon. I'm going to go door knocking here in Venice. And then I'm a door knock all day Saturday. Then I'm going to not door knock on Sunday afternoon. And in that time frame, more than likely, I'll make 25 written offers. That's how long it uh, takes. Bill, when you go door knocking, do you make them an offer while you're there? Sometimes. So a okay. good example, um, we were out on Friday and Kim was working with a realtor to let us into houses. And in a several cases, I made an offer while we were in the house before we left. Okay. Through the realtor. Yes. I, 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 but understand I wrote my offer on this. And again, when I, when I put up the video next week, you'll see each offer I wrote. So not one so far has been on one of the realtor contracts. I'm not going to take 20 pages to make a written offer. What I tell them is, I'm going to make an offer using bullets that says, here's what I can go do. Please share it with the other realtor and please, you know, share it with the seller. And I prefer the seller to be there so we can have a conversation. And if the seller is interested, then let's transfer it to the realtor contract. If the seller is not interested, don't worry about it. And that way we didn't waste 20 pieces of paper. Right. Option agreement right. That nobody understands. It's too hard. But to I'm a little confused though because when you say door knocking i was assuming that you're not using you're not going to houses that are listed with a why, realtor. Would, why, why why would i not go to houses that are listed jesse no what i'm saying is when you go to houses that are not listed with a realtor and you just go knock on the door do you make them an offer while yes. you're there at that yes. house 
Yes. Or, or if they're not there, I may put the offer in the door. I, I did, oh. I did, I did that on Sunday. There was nobody home. House was vacant. I talked to the neighbors and found out that the house had just been rehabbed. It's owned by flippers. So it wasn't an owner occupant, but I put the offer in the door. And I did a little video where you can watch me, how I get where, how I get the offer into the door and where it sits and getting it all the way through and why I do it a certain way. So okay. as I do this, I'll be shooting little videos about different things I learned, where I stand, how I address, how I talk to the seller. There'll be a number of sellers that once I'm invited in that I'm going to say, hey, can I set up a, my, my camera here on a little tripod and record us? Yeah. You know, I want to put this on, you know, and some of them will say yes. Yes. And then you all see me sitting there talking to someone and doing a, a real live T-bar. Great. Celine has a question. Yes, yeah, Celine. Oh, Hi. hi. Um, so I did my very first door knocking session uh, a couple weeks ago with the group and, um, I'm just because nobody was selling. So how many doors do you generally have to knock before you even find anyone to make an well, offer? Let's, to? let's go back to something you said. You said nobody was selling. Right. Did you talk to anybody? Yes, we, we, I mean, there was a few people we talked to that opened their doors. And did you ask them if anybody in the neighborhood was thinking about selling their house? Yes. And what do they say? They said they didn't know of anybody. Okay. So you want to talk to more people because what I find is when I'm talking to homeowners, they turn into traffic cops almost every time. So let me explain to you what I mean. Well, let's see. There's somebody over here that they have a house for sale. There's a brown one over here. And Fred down here is thinking about selling. And they just start pointing. It's just what they do. And you have to understand, for many years, I've taken groups of 60 people at a time out door knocking, right, for, for doing real estate. So I've done this for, for, for years and years and years and years. And before we ever head out, I say, I'll tell whoever I'm taking out or whatever group I'm with, I'll say, here's what's going to happen. Number one is I'll make between five and 10 written offers. So when I'm working with a group of 60, I've got to move much slower because they move slow. Getting them out of cars and getting them to doors is a pain in the butt. That's why I quit taking groups out, meaning. Um, I said, but we'll make between five and 10 written offers. Most of them had, haven't made five to 10 written offers in a year. And we're going to go do it in a day in a neighborhood I've never been in. So I want them to see how I make written offers and where the numbers come from. The second thing I tell them is eight out of 10 sellers will invite us in. Let me say that again. Eight out of 10 sellers will invite us in, all of us. And that's whether the house is listed with a realtor or a FISBO. And let me tell you what a seller is. Someone who owns the property. I'm talking to the owner. Number two, um, there's a for sale sign in the yard. Number three, um, the house is not under contract. If the house is under contract, they're going to just wave at me. It's called it's called the, my house under contract wave. They'll go, oh, no, 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 no. We got it. My house is sold. Thank you so much. My house is sold. And I'll sit back and say, well, the realtor sign is still out front. When did, you know, when did it close? Oh, it closes in two weeks. Yeah, it's sold. Thank you so much. You're not going to get in because in their head, the property sold. Now, I'll try to do a backup offer, but that's just kind of the way it works. And so when you're out there, that's what's going to happen. And that's what I'm finding when we're work, when we're working here last week, that you know eight out of ten sellers invite you in. People are kind, they're nice, and if they don't have a for sale sign in the yard, I'm going to ask the question. You know, I say, you know, I love your house, and and think back to the option I showed you on William William Street. I said to him, I love your house, I love your street, I love your neighborhood. You know, my wife and I would like to own a home here. Do you know anybody who's thinking about selling? And he's like, Yeah, me. So I run into, we call them shadow sellers, someone whose house will be on the market within the next 12 months, but nobody knows about it other than the neighbors. It's not on anybody's list. Yeah, Christina. Yes, I have a question and it's related to the door knocking as well. I've been doing sure. some door knocking as well. And my question is like, what type of offer do you do? I have a few questions. What type of offer do you do? in a vacant house when there's nobody. Okay, let, let me answer that question first. So let's say the house is vacant or maybe it's not vacant. But if I'm not able to talk to the seller 
or I'm not allowed to talk to the seller. I can't do a T-bar. Now, on William Street, we, could, we you saw that deal with the guy with the property taxes. I did a T-bar. So when I'm able to talk to them and sit down and do a T-bar, I'm going to do something called a T-bar offer. And you'll see many of those posted as I do the videos. But if I'm not able to talk to the seller, I, I have to rely on something called a teeter-totter offer. And I want you to think of a teeter-totter because a teeter-totter has two seats. And think of price and terms. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to make them a price terms offer. So let's say either there's a sign or I talk to the, the doorbell or I talk to the neighbors, but I find out they want $200,000 for the house. And, you know, price terms. So if they want $200,000 for the house, I will pay them $200,000 for the house. I say yes to $200,000. Or I'll pay four hundred, dollars Or I'll pay a trillion dollars. So when I take groups out, I've always made at least one trillion dollar offer on a house. Because it doesn't matter to me about price. But they have to give me then terms. In other words, how do I pay them this money? How much will it be? What will the terms be? But I get that seat and I get to determine that all the way through. Now, if they say to me, we want all cash, then what they're asking for is terms. How will they be paid? And I'll say, I'll pay you all cash. But now I get the price seat. And I get to name how much I'm willing to pay. And so that's called a teeter-totter offer or a price terms offer. And if I can't talk to the seller or no one's home, that's the offer I make, a teeter-totter offer. As I post the videos up next week, you'll, you'll be able to see me make a, most of my offers because the people aren't home or teeter-totter offers. Does that answer your question, Christina? Yes and no. Uh, because, okay. I mean, how can you make an offer without knowing what is the distress of the owner of the property, number one? A lot of properties that I've been door knocking on, they're renters, they're renting the property. And I think it might be a different type of approach maybe to especially when the properties are they don't look very well taken care of maybe the owner will be interested in um doing a master lease or letting me taking over the the lease and take care of the property i don't know um, okay. so let me help answer that so first off understand my offer is not in stone so my offer begins with, hi, my name is Bill. I love your house. If my offer is ever of interest, let's meet and talk over coffee. Offer number one will be a terms offer. Offer number two will be a price offer. But listen to what, what I said at the very beginning. Hi, I love your house. My wife and I would love to own a home here. If either offer is of interest, let's meet and talk over coffee. So in other words, what am I? What am? What, what's my real offer here? Is it about the amounts of money? No, I'm asking for a cup of coffee, right? Yes. So what's another? When I say a cup of coffee, what am I really asking for? I don't want coffee. To sit with this person and I want to get face to face. Exactly right. And so later on, I'm going to get a chance to inspect the house. And see what it's like inside. So I may not know what it looks like right now, but I'm going to give them some sort of offer. So think of it this way. You're going down the road and you see a car with a for sale sign in the yard. You go knock on the door and nobody's home. But you 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 look and say, you know, I'm willing to pay about $3,000 for this car. Might you just write a piece of paper and say, you know, I saw this car. I love the Honda. I wanted a new Honda. I wanted a Honda like this. I'm willing to pay about $3,000 for the car. Please give me a phone call. Let's have a cup of coffee and talk about it. Now, can that person selling the car hold you to your $3,000 offer? Yeah. No? No? No, because you can't. Because you, you need to have time to inspect it. You need to do yeah. your due diligence. Yes. Yes. You're right. Yep. So that's number one, is understand my offers are not in stone. And the second one was when I'm talking to renters, I'm not going to talk to them about the sale of the property. Because number one, that will scare the absolute bejesus out of them. Because yeah. the property sells, they're going to think they have to move. That's not good. So mm -hmm. instead, I, I'm going to get information about the neighborhood. So when I'm talking to the to, to the tenant, I usually will begin with, um, what are rents going for 
in a house like this in this neighborhood. I don't ask, what do you pay in rent? Because if you ask, what do you pay in rent? They are going to lock down on you. But if you ask, what are people paying? What what do what is a house like this? Uh, what's the rent on a house like this? So that's very open. And then they will tell you pretty much precisely what they're paying in rent. That helps me to know what are the rental amounts in that neighborhood. And so I want to kind of figure out, and then I'm going to ask them, are there a lot of rental properties in this neighborhood? Reason why I want to know that is I don't want to own a home in a neighborhood that has a lot of rental properties because usually those homes aren't well taken care of, transient. I, I want no, no part of the, a neighborhood with a lot of rentals in it. And so the tenant will tame, tell me what's going on. I might also ask, you know, just out of curiosity, you know, I'm always learning, you know, what, what is your like, landlord like to work with? What is the property like? You know, if you could have your ideal property, would you be here? Or would you be somebody else, be, be somewhere else? But you can interview the tenant to get really good, valuable information. But I'm not going to talk to the tenant about the sale of the property. Now, I may ask, hey, listen, maybe the landlord has some other properties I may be interested in. Do you happen to have his name and number? Mm, that's a good one. That's good. That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. I've done this for a long time, remember? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, AJ. Thank you, Bill. Sure, you're welcome, Christina. Good to have you on, on board. Hi, Bill. I, I met you at Azria about four or five years ago when you had your out, I think, outside the box. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I was uh, talking to Maria Giordano. You know Maria? Right. Right. I talked to Maria Giordano uh, just yesterday. And um, one of the funniest things I ever had happen was uh, when I was teaching there for the monthly uh, RIA meeting, they had, at the time, they had a great big auditorium they met in. And it was like a round stage and a round auditorium. It was great. And I was asking- Celebrity questions. theater, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a great place. But I was asking questions as I did my presentation. And there was this chick up front that kept answering the questions. She was phenomenal. And after about the fourth or fifth question she answered, I just stopped. And I can't got off the stage and I kind of went up to the rail and said, who are you? I love you. You're fantastic. And she goes, I'm Maria Giordano. I said, you are incredible. She goes, Bill, I'm teaching with you this weekend. I had never met Maria. <laughs> so that's who I taught with. And Maria is now one of my closest, mm -hmm. dearest friends. Again, I talked to her yesterday or two days ago. And we were talking about that time when I didn't know who she was. I said, you're, you're just one hot chick. You know your stuff. Good God. I said, you guys should be listening to her. She goes, I'm teaching with you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listening to you tonight, um, I've heard you before and stuff like that, but it just brought so many thoughts in my mind about different thing, how to secure it and everything else is most of this going to be covered in the manual. Yeah. Besides I mean, the well, February 3rd and 4th. Yeah. is The manual is 300 pages. So the answer is yes. There's a lot, there's a lot of information in the manual detailed information that I touch on, but the detailed information is the manual and it's well-written. Um, but at the same time, I cover a lot of, the, the ins and outs, and we go over the documents during the two days. So you're going to walk away understanding how to use the document, what options are. Because I'm just during deal school, I'm just able to have one hour, right? That's that's almost no time to, to try to cover a topic. So I can brush over the top of it. And my my goal is to find people who would be interested to let them see. You know, that there's something going on here. There's something behind this curtain. And maybe learning this is for you. For most, it's not. But for a few, there are. And those are the people I want to join me in uh, February. Okay, I guess we're about done, folks. So we're at, uh, we're at, we're at 8.50 Eastern Time. Uh, we will meet again uh, at between, we'll start at 7 p.m. Eastern Time next Wednesday, the, tw the 14th. And we'll go until 8 o'clock on the main presentation. That I do a Q&A &Q &A session afterwards. And I thank you all very much for hanging with me. And you have my phone number there on the screen. It's 770-815-8727. Feel free to give me a phone call. If I don't answer, it means I'm busy. Um, don't text me. Call me. I want to talk to you. I will have questions. You, you, you heard me tonight. You know that when you ask questions, I usually ask you a couple questions to 
better understand what you're asking so I can give you a better answer. But feel free to give me a phone call. I'm always happy to help. If you have a question about the class, um, ask away. Love you guys. Everybody have a really great night. Thanks for taking time out of your very busy, precious day to be with us. And I will see you next Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thank you so much.